So it's now time. We have a mid mid interview break. It's now time for a little game I like to call Word Vomit. Oh no. SDKs. SD Mays, thank you so much for coming on the Uniweb interview show. I'm your host, Matthew Whiteside. SD Mays, how are you doing this fine, fine day? Well, thank you for that lovely intro. I'm doing, uh, I'm doing well. Um, I've been decorating today, so I'm covered in paint. But covered in paint. Regardless of that, I am, um, you know, I'm here. I, I have showered. I don't get me wrong. I was gonna say thanks for not showering before. <laughs> I can't always get the paint off in the shower. Kind of difficult. Okay. That's right. You gotta bathe yourself in like rubbing alcohol to get that stuff off. It's okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I appreciate you coming on very much. Um, SD Maze, you are the author of Letters to the Pianist. Um, yeah. This book came out a little over about a year ago, correct? Um, it's about eighteen months actually. A little over a year ago. Okay, 18 months. Tell me, what is this book about? Oh, okay. So in a nutshell, <laughs> it's, it's about um, a family whose house is bombed in the Blitz. So it's three children. Um, Ruth, who's 14, and um, Gabby, who's 12, and Hannah, who's 10, and they wake up in a pile of rubble to find that their parents, well, they believe their parents have been killed outright in oh, the Blitz, yeah. 1941. But um, what they don't realize is their father is dragged from the rubble and taken to hospital with amnesia days later. But the um, the children are of uh, parcel Dutch relatives, uh -huh. and, uh, as which is what would happen in those times. And um, they have their own plot their own subplots that go on with a lot of conflict and challenges and things to overcome. And the father, in the meantime, wakes up with this ability to play the piano like Beethoven or Mozart, like the great maestros. So, I mean, we could know that as savant syndrome, you know, when you get a knock on the head and you can speak yeah. another language or play a musical instrument. So this is what happens to him. And he, he thinks he's always been able to play because he's got no memory. He doesn't even know his name. They are um, a Jewish family, and he meets a beautiful debutante in the hospital who's doing charity work. And to cut a long story short, he ends up being mentored by her father in his musical career. And he ends up marrying into the family, not realizing they're a family of Nazi sympathizers. Oh, no. <laughs> da, da, da. Da, da, da. Yeah, so basically, um, you know, this he goes on you know sort of not really having a memory for quite a few years but um i'm not giving away too much of the plot because this is on the back of the book but ruth okay quite a few years later on ve day she sees a picture of a pianist in the newspaper while she's eating her chips or as you say in the us french fries because you know and at the time we used to eat chips or french fries out of newspaper so um she would eat them out of paper sometimes you you still do in some shops um so she saw a picture of the pianist in the paper and she thinks that looks like my dad. And she starts getting photos and looking through. And even though he's got a different name, he's now gone from being Joseph Goldberg to being Edward Chopard. Wow. Which is like his stage name. And yeah. then what happens is uh, she, she goes, she starts to write him letters. So she, as she writes him letters, he, his memories unravel and he realizes he's in terrible danger. Oh, and when wow. he goes missing, she goes looking for him and then she ends up in terrible danger. But there, there's so much more to the story than that. He's also got secrets. Everyone is horribly flawed and got issues. And, you know, he's got his own stuff coming on. Coming, well, going that's on. why I love this is why I love asking very first question and not telling you this, but asking, tell me about your book very first, because it's like the hardest question for an author to answer because there's so because writing a book is like such a process of digging into like another world yeah. <laughs> and you're like okay tell me about it <laughs> it's like what yeah. 
where do I start, right? Okay, and there's, a, you know, a few characters and there's a lot of stuff that goes on, but you don't want to give too much away, but that's the basic premise of the book. That sounds that sounds really, really amazing. Um, I've been hitting the head a lot, and I don't have any cool superpowers like that. I wish I did. <laughs> How have you been hit on the head? Uh, <laughs> <Should> <laughs> I, <ask? laughs> I can't help? remember. <laughs> no, a lot of... A lot, a lot of football and just growing up being a crazy boy, just a lot, a lot of concussions. Okay. <laughs> we're we're, we're drawing a line under that then. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I have magical powers, but I'm not 100 percent sure. But anyway, it's a really cool premise to a story, um, especially during during that time time period. Uh, have Have you always written uh, more historical fiction, or is this your first uh, attempt at writing into historical fiction and this is my first historical fiction. Um, I didn't plan to write historical fiction. Um, the story came to me quite a few years back and it took me a while to write it because it was a complicated plot. And I actually thought it would just be a good suspense story. Yeah. I just fell in love with the story and I wanted to write it. So it was. It just happened to be set in the 40s. But in, I mean, at the moment, I'm currently writing a thriller called The Lodger. Inspired the by my the lodger, which is is like what you would call like um, a house guest or um, okay. a housemate, maybe like a roommate. A roommate, yeah. Roommate, so, okay. So it's contemporary, so it's set in modern times. It's not like. Do you see how I did that very expression expression? Yeah. <laughs> well, I it's it. I'm interested. I'm really interested in this because you said the idea came to you and it took a few years to flesh out and it came to you in that time period. It always interests me beyond end to figure out how these stories come to to writers because yeah. we all have we all seem to have a little bit different of a process but to where the story kind of ends up writing itself in a way. Do you remember what it was that triggered like this I got something. I want to I want to I want to go after it. Do you remember what it was? Um, I don't. I just remember this plot sort of unfolding in my head and then thinking how difficult it would be to write it. And then I, I found out that my mum, uh, her family home was bombed in the Blitz and various things happened. So that gave me a window into the, the childhood she had in um, the Blitz um, with her parents being killed. So then I was able to expand on my idea and... I think if it wasn't for knowing about her, I probably wouldn't have attempted to write it because it's and you've got to immerse yourself in that in that world, you know, and that's tricky. I heard the cat. I heard the and cat. She, she wants to go out, but I, I, I shall I let her out? No. <laughs> no, because then I'll leave the screen. Have she'll to have leave. to suffer. She'll be and also she'd have to she go out for like one minute and it's so windy here at the moment and then she'd come back in a minute yeah. later and I would literally just be gate her. I'd be like a doorman. Yeah, you can't be the doorman for the cat. Especially <laughs> not right now. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe later. She's just gonna she's just gonna have to do Yeah. Yeah, she'll be okay. She seems like a tough cat. <laughs> you've, you've raised... If not, she can go to a cat psychiatrist. There you go. Do you have do you have one of those on speed dial? No, but I should do. You should. <laughs> cats are cats can be a little bit temperamental, huh? Yeah, exactly. They just yeah. like feed me, obey me, and then be off with you. Okay, <laughs> that's awesome. Basically, you're their servant, and that's right. Yeah, um, <laughs> the cats. So that's that's neat. Did you, in terms of the story, did you go and do a lot of research in that time period? Did you spend like a long time in the library trying to make it as realistic as possible? I, I did. Um, took me three years to write, actually, Matt. So um, it took a huge amount of research. And I, fortunately, because we've got Google, we don't need to go to the library. That's um, true. So there's lots of things you can find on microfiche or you can find on um, different uh, um, sort of blogs or different things. There was a lot of people who'd written about their time or their childhood in the war. And I looked up those and took, you know, maybe about sort of 15 um, different anecdotes, different different, uh, different people's 
stories about parents that their children in those London places. So that was really exciting. And there was a lot of there's a lot of other stuff in the book about Hitler and his um, obsession with the supernatural. Um, oh. That plays a big part in the plot. Um, I did a lot of research on that as well. There's political figures in there and the whole environment of what it was like. I got some of it from my mum and what she'd written and, and from other people to kind of build up an image of, of how it was. So, yeah, yeah. it took a lot of research. And yeah. also Southern Syndrome as well, Southern Syndrome. Um, you know, there was a guy in, in America, actually, who jumped into a swimming pool and banged his head on the pool and, and came was able then to play the piano. So there's lots of different things that um, I researched, news items that I researched to do Southern Syndrome as well. And make sure, am I getting this correct? You used to be a journalist, is that right? Yeah, no, I, well, I still, I still am a ge- journalist, yeah. Okay. So over 20 years as a journalist. The so human interest in health stories. <laughs> that probably helped a lot with your researching. I mean, you've, you're used to digging in and finding out the facts about things, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I always have to research and look up things. I quite enjoy that, building a picture. Yeah. But I did, you know, human interest stories. There would be like mini biographies, timeless pieces that balance out the hard news stories. That would be, you know, um, what somebody wanted to talk about that had happened to them, an emotional oh. story. And <clears throat> they're usually about two and a half thousand words. So, yeah, I would normally write those. I didn't do like celebrity stories or um, political stories, just more human interest in health. That's okay. my niche, or as you say, niche in niche. America. So, yeah. <laughs> Nietzsche. Is that so? Is that always something that's always interested you? Uh, what, human interest? Yeah. Yeah. The human condition. The human condition. Psychology. What is it about you find so interesting? Um, what makes people tick? What makes people do what they do? I think is interesting, isn't it? Um, we all we're all interested in that, aren't we? Yeah, I think so. I know I am. Yeah, I'm exactly. I think trying to figure out myself half the time, like self discovery, has been has been so much into my human discovery, like realizing that I'm a lot the same as everyone else. But trying to trying to to discover that is uh, a work in itself. How long? And a lot the same. A lot, a lot the same, and a lot different. You mean? Yeah, I mean, I'm. I know I'm a lot the same. I mean, uh, there's so many similarities between me and everybody I talk to. Like, it, it, I, I think that we get we can get stuck as a as a um, species at looking at each other and seeing the immediate differences. Yeah. But, I- like learning that, and you know this as a journalist too, like having sitting down and having a conversation with somebody, it's where you understand that, okay, mm. there, it, there's so many different levels where it's not just this. There's like so many different levels that we connect on and we can connect on as human beings that, you know, is so important for us. I'm going to take this with me. Okay. While you I can, let my cat Because she's driving me um, literally around the twist. Round the twist. Yeah. Do you have that expression in America? Round the twist. Uh uh-uh, uh, never heard it before. You never heard it. Uh uh-uh. uh. Right. Driving you round the twist. It means like driving you demented, driving okay. you crazy. We have driving you nuts and like driving me up the wall. That kind of. Oh yeah, thing. we have. Well, well that's I mean, another English expression. Round the yeah. twist. Round the twist. I guess we just never picked up that one because you guys have more roundabouts than we do we don't have all the i think that may be why i don't think it's roundabouts but i don't know where it came from just an old expression yeah i don't know (laughs) okay so it's now time we have a mid mid interview break it's now time for a little game i like to call word (laughs) this is what it is for people who don't know word vomit is where the author that I'm interviewing is going to say as many words as possible in 10 seconds. Just any words that come to mind. They have 10 seconds. The record right now 
Just 42 words in 10 seconds. Are you going to time me? I am. Okay, I'm ready. <sighs> Here we go. On your mark. Get set. Word vomit. Go. Go. Wait. No, wait, wait. Cauliflower <laughs> cheese. Oh. Wait. Okay. okay. I should have said. I should have said go instead of word vomit. <laughs> that was yeah, because I was you threw me. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Ready. Set. Go. Okay. Cauliflower cheese, peanuts, colada, pina colada. Tea, coffee, juice, milk, sarsaparilla. Stop. Um, that was 13 words. And I think you're hungry. <laughs> I know. Do you know why? I actually was hungry. You were. So that's one of the reasons I like to do it, the game, word vomit, because when you're told to think of words, your brain kind of clogs itself up and it only focuses on like the most basic things that you can like whatever you whatever survival is right and it yeah. kind of gets into your psyche of what somebody's what somebody's thinking and right away food. everything food was drink. food <laughs> SD, colada, yeah. sd Mays is hungry <laughs> did you have well i guess it's what like four o'clock over there right yeah no well, i was hungry earlier because I, I hadn't really had a chance to sit down so just before i spoke to you like i just had some stir fry Stir fry. I didn't get a chance to eat my chocolate. Oh. My comfort. Your comfort. Yeah, we always knew that comfort stuff. Well, thank you. Thanks for being a good sport and playing Word Vomit with me. Um, the The record is not 42. I haven't actually played that game with anybody else yet, so you were the first one. <laughs> oh, my God, I was a guinea pig, and you just Yeah, but I, I had to make you feel confident, you know, that other people are doing it. I've, <laughs> I've played other oh, games with people. Said. That's a lot of words, 42. Yeah, that's too many. Yeah, it's Did you want to see my book, by the way? Here it is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, of course I want to see it. Hold it hold it up and still for me. There we go. Letters to the piano. Now, this cover is uh, an award-winning cover, correct? It was a... Yes. It won a Roan Award. Um, when was it? Uh, last year? End of last year. Wow. In L.A., so um, it's out in hardback, paperback, and ebook, obviously. So um, you're yeah. traditionally published, correct? Yeah, the publishers designed that. The the HC. So technically, they won the award. <laughs> <laughs> but it's got your name on it, so it counts. Yeah, exactly. But that's that's cool. So did you for the uh, you've written three books thus far, yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. And this is the third book. Um, the first two books were those also published by the same publishing house or were they no um the first book was self-help and that came out i'm trying to think <clears throat> 17 years ago i was going to say 18 17 years ago that was with hodder and stanton who were one of the big five publishers um hodder mobius so um yeah that that was kind of pre the secret um techniques kind of fun quick lots of quizzes and interaction um so it's a how to use your mind how to tap into your intuition to buy the right house get the right job and it's also sort of uh law of attraction type visualization so what's it um, called i just want to say it's um, four years before the secret because the secret do kind of make a statement that nobody else has ever done on this before actually carl young was the first person who um talked about law of attraction and the unus mundus and how we're all connected to the unus mundus which is latin for one world and one energy um yeah. so he was the originator of that idea um it was called it's called be your own psychic be your own psychic very cool. yeah okay. yeah that's it i want to i want to ask you more about this book too because that's something that interests me do you so with the law of attraction and being an intuition um all all sense like intuition is a sense that i think we all have just yeah, to, exactly. be, to be developed more um yeah. in certain people and it's not based off necessarily our five senses it's based off of 
something different, correct? Like a frequency that we're six cents, like the movie Six Sense. So it's six cents. <laughs> so if it's um look, well, it's you know, it's the right side of the brain. So the more creative we are, the more we are naturally more intuitive, and the more naturally more intuitive we are, the more creative we are. Okay. So it's very much like a skill. I have to excuse my phone going off. It's like a yeah. skill that you can learn. So when you visualize um, and you use creative visualization, you naturally also tap into your intuition because it's all right brain sci scientifically on that on that level. So the right brain, the left brain, left side of the brain is logic and um, being more pragmatic, and um, which we also need. We need a balance of both because right. you can be creative and intuitive, but you can't necessarily make that work for you practically in everyday life without the right. left side of your brain. And if you're left brained and you don't use it the right side of your brain, then you can be very logical and competitive and go after what you want, but you could get there a lot quicker by using your your intuition and your hunches. Mm. You know? So like those those guttural feelings of that's the wrong way kind of thing. Don't go that way. <laughs> But that you need to kind of practice because sometimes we think we're having a gut feeling and and it's an in instinct, you know, and sometimes we get clouded by our own issues of like paranoia or, you know, our um, uh, wrong judgment and stuff like that. So it takes a bit of practice, you know, using sure. um, that, that as a tool to get it correct. And it's like anything you have to practice to, to get yeah. it right. And I think it's important to listen to yourself in a lot of different ways, not just in intuition, but like, I feel like, um, especially with American culture, it's all about push, 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 like go past being tired or hungry or whatever it is. It's like we stop listening to ourselves. And yeah. when, when we're tired, hungry, lonely, whatever it is, we're just like, shut up. I'm going to do the thing, whatever, no matter what. And mm. I think that's important, too, to be able to listen to that part of your, your senses so that it becomes easier to listen to the. Would you agree with that or? Yeah, I do. I think I think um, there is a big, you know, uh, thing about the American dream, isn't there? And you know, you chase after what you want. Um, <clears throat> I, I do feel though that we don't need to be in competition with anyone. And yeah. some people get very competitive, and we don't need to do that because actually, there's room for everybody. Mm. So once we embrace that, you know, there is room for everyone. We don't need to, you know, because intuition is the voice of your soul, not of your ego. So ego is about competition, but your your intuition when you follow that is really about everything is relaxed and I, I know where I'm going, but I can go and allow things, on, you know, I can allow things to unfold knowing that that's my vision. And law of attraction is very much about that because as soon as you get into competitiveness and ego, then you lose the vibration, the high frequency vibration that you need to attract mm -hmm. situations to you. Yeah, I am. That's something I totally believe that we we are all and and it's one thing one reason why I wanted to do this too is because like I have no fear that somebody else is gonna like take my spot atop the mountain that I want to get to. I, I believe that there's plenty for everything everybody to go around like and what my vision of success is is different than somebody else's vision. So it's like we're not even traversing necessarily the same path, and to think yeah. that I can't lift somebody else up because I'm afraid that me by lifting them that they're going to take my spot is it's a it's it's almost it's thinking in lack like the this mm -hmm. universe is so abundant right that, like to think in that way is almost a sick way of thought yeah exactly but so what love, do, you, do you have any practices like like a tip you would say to to anybody who's wanting to get more in touch with their intuition that they could they could uh try yeah what they could try as a quick tip is um Visualize yourself um, floating out of your body and going up into the sky as high as you can until you're floating on a cloud and okay. imagine yourself and what the cloud feels like, get a sense of what it's like. It can be whatever it wants to be for you. Mm -hmm. um, fluffy, soft, warm, cool. <clears throat> and imagine looking down on the earth below and what you can see. As soon as you go up in your visualization and you you uh, you allow your mind energy to go upwards, you actually release lots of tension that you might be carrying in your your shoulders or your head. Um, 
So if you visualize doing that and you can also visualize yourself going even higher, going towards the sun, going towards the moon. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you, you know, you feel yourself floating around and then slowly come back down and you'll feel more lightheaded. And the reason you feel more lightheaded is you've released tension. Wow. It's like a astral kind of meditation. Do you, do you uh, practice meditation in that way or is that just... Yeah, I do, I do practice meditation, but it is, a, it is a meditation. Visualization is a form of meditation. I mean, another one that you can do is <clears throat> visualizing the top of your head being removed and that like, you're under this beautiful waterfall of water that's uh -huh. pouring down. I don't mean removed with a, a hat or a hat. Or <laughs> okay, like sorry. <laughs> you're everything up. It's not a yeah. horror story. And you're filled with like this fresh sparkling water that fills you up all the way from your right down to your feet all the way up to the top of your head and as it fills you up it's getting rid of any tension and black spots and anything that needs like cleansing and then when it goes to the top of your head imagine it building up around you so it builds up all the way you know to uh water all the way around you and that's also really good for cleansing your aura and your aura is um just your mind you know, aspects of your mind. So <clears throat> imagine it cleansing your mind. That, that's what it's doing when you do that. Wow, that's cool. I, um, I've, done the, I've done the visualization where it wasn't water, but it was like a beam of pure light and energy that just kind of was flowing through me. I do, I do meditation too. All this stuff really interests me. So it's really, I had no idea you did the, um, the book 17 years ago even before the secret because i remember when the secret came out and thought it was the coolest thing ever but i also realized it's not just about like believing that you're supposed to have something it's about like actually taking action and doing something too oh, oh yeah absolutely you've got to take steps towards what you want i did yeah. the light one is also good that's a good one i mean i i, I have lots of visualizations that people can look at um on my website sharonmays.co.uk mm -hmm. uh, so, which will be in the description of this video by the way um is is that book is that still available for sale on amazon yeah, it is? Okay. yeah and um paperback and you can get ebook an ebook yeah awesome. they have to start with, but you can get the ebook okay very cool and so the the so this would be the second book. What, what's the uh, the second book you wrote, have written? So that was my first book. The second book is a young adult book, um, which is about, um, based on a true story about a girl I interviewed, a teenager, who, um, but I based the novel on, on a pageant queen in America, actually, okay. in Cedarville, which is North California. Have you heard of Cedarville? It's like desert country. So it's... Uh -uh. it's uh, sort of, um, I don't want to say the wrong thing. So I, my my memory for names is terrible, but it's um, <clears throat> it's all desert in in North okay. California. So it's um, about a girl that lives there. She's kind of like um, sees herself as a big fish in a small pond. So she's a beautiful pageant queen. She's very vain. She has lots of Instagram followers, lots of Twitter followers, and Facebook. And then her father, she's the only child, spoiled only child, and she's been bought a, a really beautiful sports car by her father. And she ends up crashing the car when Ooh. she goes out drinking with her friend to celebrate her engagement to her um, handsome boyfriend because everything in her world is perfect. And yeah. she ends up in a wheelchair and, <coughs> and she, her whole life changes. Um, her father... Um, runs off with his secretary, her mother runs to drink, her boyfriend runs off with her best friend. And she has to go through this transformation. She's in hospital for six months. So she becomes paraplegic and mm. ends up talking to somebody online who's a student doctor in another country. And um, but he he doesn't know that she's had an accident and she hides it from him. But it's kind of a quirky love story, but it's also based on um a true story. Okay. I think about, it was a British girl, but I, I based this in America, but it was inspired by 
a British girl um, who I interviewed who had this car accident and wow. ended up in a wheelchair. It was like a discovery of the more important things in life, I guess. It was, it was a yeah. fictionalization of the... Okay. Wow. But she was kind of like a social media junkie and realized that actually when something bad happened to her, she wasn't sure whether she even had any real friends, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's something that, you know, we think about a lot in today's culture with there's, we all have so many friends online, but like, do you ever, do we ever leave the front door and, uh, go talk? Like how many of us go and have coffee with friends or go do things? I do. With, <laughs> right. Yeah. And I know, yeah, <laughs> there are a lot of us still that do that. And I, I feel like, there's a great place like a, a really online is used properly it's a great way to connect with other people in different cultures and expand how we learn and grow doing things like this being able to talk face to face with another human being that i've met online is so important but then also having the the wherewithal to know that i have to go outside into my actual community where i live and build mm -hmm. those relationships as well because i still live in a you know 10 mile, five mile radius where everything happens in my life. That if something bad were to happen, people, you know, you're in England or people that are across the, the globe wouldn't be able to do much for me besides, you know, send me nice tweets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which but I would love nice tweets, but. It's kind of like, a, you know, uh, a bittersweet story. Yeah. But it, again, it was one. In fact, what happened is I started writing letters to the pianist and letters to the pianist, if you read it, if you do get a chance to read it, it's very complex. There's a lot of subplots and um, mm -hmm. <coughs> a lot of twists and turns. So I had to stop and then I decided to write this other book, which was completely different. And I had to get a different agent, change my agent, go to, go to someone else because they're like doctors. They specialize in different genres. Yeah. And then I continued with letters afterwards when, when I had a, a bit of a break. Wow. So fresh eyes. how, um, I want to talk about that too. So you've, you've been traditionally published through with all three books, but you've used different agents for the books as well. Stop the world, the book, um, about the, the young adult book. That's not, that's self published because what happened is I had another agent. I had three agents that really loved that book. Okay. Um, I chose one agent in London who's Italian, Italian agent, quite well known as Italian agent. And she really loved it, but she tried to sell it for a year because you can get an agent and they still have to sell it to a publisher. And right. she just couldn't sell it. They, she kept sending me the feedback and it was either like, it was either too American or it wasn't American enough, or it was either they should be more with the father or they should be more with the mother. You know, there was like, it was never just the same kind of feedback it was always something yeah. and um i mean it was kind of likened to um oh god what's that what's that book called uh you know the the john green books you know um oh god, what's it called again I remember, but you know john green you know the author john green right mm -hmm. you don't know it no. We're watching this. No, but you know it was similar to um, the Fault in Our Stars. Yeah, so it was a long road. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And they kept saying it's a very precious spot, and it's very you know we we have to be careful how we fill it, but we like the writing. And in the end, it just wasn't you know she tried really hard. So in I'd gone through so much with her as an agent, we'd gone through it. So in yeah. the end, I thought well, I'm not going to waste the book. I need to self publish it, you know, because on Amazon because we've done all this work on it and she still she couldn't understand why it wasn't snapped up you know but okay. yeah so how did you do how did it do when you self-published it how did I do it how did how did it do the book like when you self-published it obviously you had to do the marketing and all that kind of stuff by yourself um and did it do honest, as well as you I, thought it would it's not really done that well that particular book you know mm -hmm. it hasn't done that well I think it's quite hard when you do everything yourself you know um it's had some good reviews but it's never really taken off because it you know it's it's difficult when you and then when I had letters come out I put a lot of my own you know push into that you know with bloggers and things like that you know my publishers obviously <clears throat> my book was up for the Rhone award and they organized all of that and 
and various things in the States because it's an American publishers. But I had to um, do things my end as well. So, Well, uh, and that's, that's one of the things I, I like to get into uh, the most because I do talk to a lot of independently published authors. And one of the things I find is there, there's so many great stories out there, but trying to get them in front of the right readers is some of the most difficult things we can do. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I, what I would say as well is I also work as an editor and I okay. also do story analysis. Um, so I'm working on an author's book, their second book. The first um, book I edited and did story analysis on, they got a publication deal. Um, oh, wow. They then have a, a book two out that they want to get it edited and go through the story. And so, um, and he's based in America. But what I would say about a lot of self-published authors is they don't get enough beta readers looking at their story. They don't work hard enough on getting their story polished. And I'm not saying this to offend anyone who says, well, I do. I get my story, you know, looked at because that's great if you're self-published and you do that. But in my ex in my experience, that's the exception. Most of, most people write something and they don't know a lot about writing techniques. And when I get their manuscripts... Um, Hand raised right here. <laughs> yeah, but, but then you get the manuscript and you find out actually, you know, show not tell, for example, which is the premise yeah. of all writing. Showing is painting a picture, describing yeah. characters, describing events in a filmic way. Um, right. And a lot of people don't do that. And so when you're not, um, if you don't have the experience of writing, then you're telling summarizing and it, it reads like a very rushed summary so the person can't the reader can't get a real vivid description you know sure. of what you're saying so most of the time I'm saying describe 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 show you know um stop summarizing you know so I think that this is quite common there's lots of other little tips but that is the premise of all writing which is showing and um describing what's happening in your book right. and you know, uh, I think that that's the problem. You know, it's all very well saying I want to write. Writing is a craft. It's the skill that needs to be worked at. Yeah. And you need to be, take, take criticism. Even Stephen King, who is majorly successful, has six beta readers that are not friends and family. And he will tell you that in his book on writing. You know, right. you need to have objective analysis. You don't pay for this. Lots of people will beta read for free. You can go on Goodreads and find free beta readers. Um, yeah. But story analysis and people reading through the story and saying I don't get this or I don't understand this is really important because when you write your own book you can't always see the wood for the trees you know and that's a cliche and I use that cliche because that's the other thing we're not as writers we should not be using cliches in our story you know right. we need thinking of unique metaphors so again when I do editing I'm pointing out cliches I'm pointing out um points of view or past or present tense that are mixed up and when somebody's telling and not showing and things like that so that they can get their story straight and that's really normal you know it's quite normal to do 10 12 15 20 drafts of a book yeah. to get it right and if you want to just like churn out a book and get it online and you know you haven't gone through it or haven't had it edited properly you can't you know the market is saturated with books there's a lot of choice you can't then complain if you get bad reviews because sure. people are thinking, well, the editing's bad or the story doesn't make sense because you have to do that work. Yeah. You have to make sure that your story gets looked at. Well, I 100% agree with that. And I'll, I'll say this too, the, the, the people I've seen who um, or I've talked to is about self-publishing, they kind of understand that it is, it's a craft okay. we have to be willing That's to work on. It's okay. It's okay. It's got to be a craft that we're willing to work on because it's not like a if, it, if it's just a short term, like, let me write this book and put it out and then I'll see you 20 years from now without doing anything else. Then you've kind of lost the point. You're not really writing because you love to write. You're writing because you're hoping to get a lottery ticket. Um, and I think most. The thing is, though, Matt, as well, is that. The thing is that it's it's there's a lot of books out there. Yeah. And if you want to if you want to be competitive, you know, um, if you want your book to do well, then you need to have a good manuscript and you need your story to make sense. Yeah. You know, the story, you know, um, a lot of people will get past bad grammar and punctuation and things like that. A lot of agents will look past that. A lot of publishers will if the story is good. 
But sometimes, you know, often you read it and the story doesn't really make sense or characters are very contradictory or, you know, yeah. um, you know, uh, there's lots of examples I can give, but I wouldn't, you know, I have to be careful what I say because I don't want to offend anybody, you know, in manuscripts I've read. But, you know, I do it with my book as well. You know, like with my book, I hand it over and I have to have a thick skin. You know, I have to kind of accept what comes back because that's going to make my story better. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, defining what your goal is, what you want to get out of your the book you're writing is so important because, like you said, I mean, if you're somebody who wants to have a career as a writer and wants to sell books, it's like, well, then pour as much effort into putting out the best, absolute best product that you can. But there's this exactly. methodology. There's this methodology right now with self-publishing, and I think it's I think it's doing more harm than good necessarily. But it's it's a twenty book published twenty books make $50,000 a year kind of as a writer. Um, and now depending on how people do that, but because there's all, there's like all kinds of groups that are that are promoting this and, and writers who are promoting this too, that you write, write a book, write a book, write a book, put it out within three months of each other. Um, that's how you're gonna make money selling books. Well, there, there is a lot to be said for the fact that if you have a lot, you know, a series of books or lots of books, yeah. You know, that do well but your book has to you know it has to stand up to scrutiny sure you know you're only as good as what people say if you've got if you've got like you know um lots of really bad reviews because yeah. you know, it's so badly done you're not going to get people buying book after book you know you have to put out yeah. quality product and i can tell you that the people that i know that do have book series out and who do churn out lots of books they have professional editors right and a lot of people have put their book out there only to take it back off Amazon and get it re-edited because it, it's not, you know, they're getting bad reviews. Yeah. So you know, well, if you scrimp on that, everybody thinks that they can write. And to a certain degree, that's true. But it's like anything. It's a craft that has to be worked out. And there are yeah. certain writing techniques that are there in place for a reason. And, um, you know, uh, I, I've, I've, edited like well over 100 manuscripts in the last few years and I get seen a lot of different genres um, and a lot of them need you know most of those 99% of them need a lot of work you know so when I've gone through it it's like you get your homework back which is like it would be the same with an agent by the way it'd be the same with a publisher you get marks on your manuscript you don't nobody gets to put in a, a manuscript and it goes straight into press it doesn't work like that stuff that needs to be ironed out and there's stuff that you miss sometimes there's lots of repetitions um you know recently you know like in a in a book I read not this current one but recently there's endless repetitions of the same thing going on and on throughout the book where right. you also kind of forget that the reader knows that you said it a couple of times yeah. so you just need to keep reiterating and that's what an editor picks up on they they see it objectively and they'll go through and they'll point those things out so that you can iron that out you know, and you have to want to make it better. This idea of, oh, you know, I'm going to hit the jackpot and get a book out there. You know, people that get books out there and make a success have a well-edited, polished book, especially yeah. by the time it's gone to a publisher. You know, it's, it's had a lot of work done on it. So in my mind, if it's worth, something's worth doing, it's worth doing well. And yeah. if you don't want to do it well, then just don't bother. You know what I mean? Don't waste your time and everyone else's time and, and then right. complain about getting your book read because, you know, word of mouth will spread about your book. You know, there's lots of book groups on Facebook. There's oh, lots yeah. of connections on Twitter. And if people like your book, they will talk about your book and say, this is a great book. What you don't want is people to say, you know, this book was terribly edited or I can't read it or the plot doesn't make sense to me. You get right. lots of people saying that then because you put all that work in. So, you know, like put the work in and, you know, I mean, I, I just feel like for me, I mean, I'm a Virgo. I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Yeah. And that is painful to live with. But uh, <laughs> I do, whatever you do. No, but you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's hard if you if you are like that because yeah. you feel about yourself, you know, that is this ever good enough? Is it ever good enough? And you can feel that about lots of things in your own life you know um but it does mean that for me I think if you're going to do something do it properly if you're going to clean the house do it properly you know don't don't do things like by half measures you know because 
people know when you've worked really hard and they see it and it shines through and that gives a reader confidence in you as an author as well yeah yeah there's definitely a lot to be said for taking your time with the projects because um, it can definitely i know for for me it was exciting writing my first book and as i'm an aries and as an aries i uh i like to be oh, on fire joking. Hope, did, did you give me one of these yeah i'm joking i'm joking i'm dangerous i'm dangerous i, I know my brother's an aries it's mine was an aries she's passed away now but yeah i it's I know we we uh, we run hot and we we get really um, headstrong and excited about things. Um, I'm not going to judge you by my mother, by the way. It's fine. Okay, it's good. Not. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure we're different. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Possibly, possibly a little bit. Um, but like I said, I think, and I, there's a ton of credence to what you're saying. I mean, you've read so many manuscripts and you've published um, really good books in your own right. Uh, that there is something to taking your time with a product that you want people to love as much as you love it and but allowing yeah, it. Don't rush. It yeah. Don't rush. Lots of people rush to publication and then they complain their book's not getting read or they take it back off and they end up getting it edited again. And it's much better and more professional to get your book out there the first time without glaring errors rather than then taking it off again, you know, to redo it and you know um I'm the thing with my mind by the way I edit but even though I edit other people's I don't edit just edit myself I give it to other people to give yeah. their feedback because it's essential as a writer it's really important yeah because you can't see you can't always see your own mistakes it's like no, it's it's much to see the wood other in somebody else's eye than it is to see the, the splinter in your own or the plank in your own, right? It's like you, you know, if you think of a, a manuscript as you know, it can be anything from sixty to one hundred and forty thousand words, for example. You know, it's like a novella, but they're they're big pieces of work, and it, it's a lot, you know, to go through. And you know, we can't remember always what we said, and that's why somebody else can come in. And I take notes as I go along as well. So I do a report at the end. So I make notes on and things that I've seen or recurring patterns or repetition like that. If you've named a character suddenly something different, or you know, yeah, all those things, you know. So what would you? Uh, I think that's great advice um, for a lot of for a lot of writers, and especially well for, for me when I first started writing, um, I had no clue who to to connect with to edit my book to look to have beta, beta readers i didn't know any of this was like possible um, i didn't know the process what would you recommend where people would start looking first um and well, to I have my, own, my own um facebook page which is called the editing den okay um but also you can go on goodreads there's a goodreads thread which is um you can also get free feedback and if you type in if you google beta readers on goodreads then it will take you to a thread and there is a section for people to give free feedback remember though if you're getting free feedback you know people won't necessarily get back to you with their with your book they won't necessarily competently give you information they'll give you a little bit but they won't necessarily, you know, so if you're getting a paid paid analysis, you will get a deadline date, you will get that information, or you should be getting that. Um, you, you'll be getting, you know, lots of things flagged up, like, cohesively and in a way that's going to help you. But it's still, um, I've had people who do free beta readers, and I still use them today. They've been amazing. I mean, I have a lady who's in her 70s in America, um, and she's Bible Belt. She's really like, I mean, she's read all my books and she is one of the most brilliant beta readers. She's so good on story analysis. She's so thorough. She doesn't care if there's the sex scene. I mean, if I if I was to logically look at her, I think I'd never send her my book. She's always yeah. writing the Bible and stuff like that. But actually, she's been brilliant, you know, with giving the feedback that you need. Um, anything yeah. that doesn't make sense, she'll tell you, you know, um, She's so you you can get some really good free beta readers on there, and that's what they're called. So they okay. will provide you. It's a bit like having a you know a test for a movie. You know when you have to go to cinema and you see the test screening. Um, the previews. The, the test screens of movies. You know where you get you know you give feedback. I don't know if you've ever been to one oh, okay. of those. I know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. 
So it's like that, you know, people will flag up and you can correct. And actually, I had about I have about five or six that work on a manuscript at the same time, and they will all flag up different things. It's, yeah. you know, people see different things and it's really helpful. So. So the idea of letting as many people read the read the manuscript or their quality people read the manuscript prior to publishing is essential, you feel, to... Yeah. Okay. I would say get six and then correct six. whatever it comes back. Yeah, you don't want loads and loads because it could get confusing. I would say go for six. Um, when they all come back with their feedback, you know, or as they come back with their feedback, correct what you feel is you agree with because some mm -hmm. things you may not agree with, but if you correct what you agree with and then go for um, get it beta reader, get read again, either by the same people if they, or if they don't want to read the same book, then different people. But keep doing it until it's clean. Clean your manuscript up, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so and, nobody's and interested. Then, and then the final result, when you think it's done, then get an editor. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's all so, so many crucial steps involved in the process that I'm obviously, I'm coming to learn through talking to all, all the different authors I've talked to, but I, th I think is, is something that, a lot of new writers have no clue on where to start and I mean there's so many yeah, I think exactly. everybody has has great stories to tell and I think a lot of people want to be able to write them but if they don't know the process of getting there it can they can they can get they can you know feel like stopping before they even get started because they put out a book too soon or something happens and <coughs> yeah I mean I know I've had people come to me as well this year saying I'm really stuck on my story I've been messing with this for years I can't, I don't know how to move it forward. And I've worked with that as well. So, and I, I've explained to them and I, I also explain people to people writing techniques in the show, not how, and I give examples of how you do that with a paragraph, how you show and not summarize, you know, right. um, how you flesh out a character. So I'll give examples, which not all editors do, but I do because a lot of people, if you just say describe or show, they're still not really sure what you mean by that, yeah. you know. So, for example, also when you're describing a character, you can't just say Matt, who's six foot two with dark hair and um, he's wearing a black hoodie. You, you can't just list stuff either, like a shopping list. Right. It needs to be drip fed in. So Matt's right. hunched over his laptop. He runs his hand through his dark hair, um, gives a quizzical look. You know, you know what I mean? What, what I'm saying is like, yeah, I see. it's got to be dripped in with, but it's got to be fed in with body language. You can't just write a shopping list of description as well. You know, it's all, yeah. all about. Because you're creating a movie in somebody's head, basically. Exactly. You're creating <laughs> yeah. a movie, yeah. So you need to have body language and you can, you can put description within the body language. You know, you you're can. You're basically connecting senses, people's senses to words. Yes. Does this feel how how would it smell or taste or what is the, what yeah. is the sen sensual effect of the cloth or the movement of the person's body mm. and essence, yeah of what's going on and that's I mean it's difficult because a lot of people or it's not difficult but it's something that is or it has to be worked on because it can get lost and like if you're writing all day long you get tired and you're like I'm just gonna list out what this person is dressed like because I'm freaking exhausted. And, you know, you, and I just think people do that from exhaustion. I think they just don't know how to describe a character. Well, I don't think it's done out of exhaustion. I think it's just well, like... I'm not I saying everybody is just like... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it does happen where people get so caught up in writing their story um, because they, they're like in love with their story that they're just trying to get it all out there. And so it gets kind of... It gets it gets clogged up in the log jam. And if it doesn't... Yeah. If, if we don't have people who are beta readers or editors to... To come back and be like this needs to be looked at this needs to be looked at then you know we kind of we kind of mess up our own our own work i honestly would say the most valuable thing you can do as a writer at any level whether you're new or or you've had a few books out is always get beta readers you can go yeah. to good you can go you can ask on all the book there's lots of different book clubs on facebook and you can ask on there as well and say does anybody want to be to read my book you know and give me feedback but the thing is that they must really be people that you don't know. Nobody who you know is going to give you an honest evaluation. They're not going to want to upset you. They're always going to flatter your ego slightly because they're not going to want to 
um, get on the wrong side of you, are they? You know, unless you have got like, you know, a sibling that might actually um, want to psychologically murder you <laughs> and take great relish in um, rubbish. <laughs> we all have some siblings like that. You know, I'm not everybody, but you know, I'm sure people have ones like that. But yeah. what I would say is generally speaking, go to people that you don't know, that there's no kind of, um, there's no kind of, uh, um, she's going to not be my friend if I say the wrong thing. You know, you need to have honest objectivity. And really, that's what you're paying for when you get your story evaluated as well. I mean, I'm really thorough. So I go through manuscript line by line by line. And it is takes me hours just to go through sometimes one scene. Because I'm looking at everything, you know, I'm looking at the gram, looking at the, the sentence formula, formulation, I'm looking at if it's clunky, um, but I'm also looking at the, are they showing, are they describing, you know, is this seemingly rushed, is there too much of a war scene or battle scene going on, lots yeah. of guys yeah. to write very long car chases, Um you know, um, lots of things like that, if you think, well, I'm really into this, but is somebody you've got to imagine your market audience is it as a woman going to be reading it, men going to be reading it you know young old is this going to get tedious if I go on for too long because you don't want it pages and pages for example of battle scenes or car chases right right so um I think sometimes writers can get quite indulgent when they're really into a scene do you know you know what I mean so yeah, yeah. we're making ourselves feel good like this is yeah we're, we're enjoying the story more than somebody we're enjoying- else so it's kind of self-indulgent, but it's like you've got to remember, like, if you want people to like your book as well, you know, because I cut out loads and loads of stuff, um, you know, in my book, you know, where it went on for too long. And some of the things I really liked. Um, but Carl, would you mind letting Safi out? Mm-hmm. Sorry, she's my cat's meow. <laughs> <laughs> so, um. Yeah, I knew she would do this. She goes in. It's like she just wants a doorman. You know, she's like in, out, in, out, in, out. <laughs> Dang cat. She needs to make up her mind. I know. I'm glad she doesn't have a cat flap, though, because this would be going on all night long. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's it's so much amazing information, SD Mays. Thank you so much. I want to um, – are your services for uh, – are you – taking more manuscripts or is that something you yeah, offer no, I, do, I put people in I'm, I'm in the middle of a manuscript at the moment like I say this is book two of an author he's actually I think um Juan Zapata he's um written a great novel called Golden Skies which I edited a couple of years ago and he got a publishing deal and then the publishers asked me to do a, a review for the back cover which I did mm-hmm. um but he did you know um accept that it took him a while to get there you know and he had to take on the feedback so I'm now working on his book too which okay. I'll have finished by the end of next week and then um so I tend to do a two-week turnaround so yeah I'm, I'm I'm taking bookings people can book in and then I book that place in the diary for them and then no one else will take that slot so and I've just completed one um of a British author before him so um but yeah, I do that between my own writing and um, put my own writing on hold when I do that, and then. Do, and you, uh, you're you you'd be used after the beta readers, correct? Yeah, it's. I mean, I do story analysis as well. So if people are really stuck with their story, I will sort that out and I will okay. show them what they're going wrong. Um, a free beta reader won't necessarily have the skills to do that because they won't necessarily know about show not tell and things like that. But you can get yeah your free beta readers as well from Goodreads and on book book groups. Everybody okay. will. But all writers know about that, and you get feedback as well. So. Okay. Cool. So I'll put links and everything like that in the description. Also, links to all your books um, will be in the description of this video. SD, I really appreciate your time uh, coming on and, and sharing your wealth of knowledge and also about your amazing stories that you've already written um, yourself. I can't wait to check out the books. They sound amazing. Thank you. I'm going to check out yours as well, Matt. Okay. Don't read it. You scared the crap out of me. Do not read it. (laughs) No, here's, here's the feedback I've gotten on mine. The story is good, but the grammar and editing is terrible because I wrote it. (laughs) I I edited it because I didn't, this was, Something brand new for me. You you can read it, sure. Go ahead and tell me exactly. What, tell me exactly what you think. 
I'm so scared. I, I think the <laughs> thing is that if you're going to put out a book, I mean, another author, a friend of mine, said this recently, that when you put your book out to the public, it no longer belongs to you. It belongs to the public. So yeah. in other words, if you're going to start doing things like that, if you're going to put out a book that isn't been edited or looked at by other people prior to that, then, you know, you can't expect oh, it to be whipped off the shelves and everyone to give you glowing reviews. It's just, it, it's, you know, but like you say, lots of writers don't know that you have to do that. What's it called? Like, I, I don't think that it's going to win book of the year or anything like that. I, uh, I did it for, for personal reasons for myself and what I needed to get out in terms of my recovery through addiction and stuff like that. And the okay. things I needed to process, um, I think it's an amazing story to me, um, whether it comes through to other people is, you know, but it's also not something that, you know, like I said, I, I don't think it's going to be the number one bestseller because I know there's, there's stuff in it that needs a lot of work, but it was, I, I know that when I published it, it was like the most freeing experience of my life because I, I felt like I told my story all, the only way it could come out. And, uh, it just felt like it was a weight lifted, you know. It was really neat. Well, that's really good if it did that for you. Yeah. I think it can be really cathartic. And oh, I mean, is even when your book is polished, even when you've done, you know, you've, you've you've had all the story analysis come back and you've done the best you can be, there's still going to be people that hate your book. People will yeah. love it. People will hate it. But yeah. the most important thing is you do need to get it um, looked at by uh, by other people and get some objective feedback because, you know. It's amazing how we repeat things without realizing it. When I get stuff come back, I think, oh, my God, I can't even believe I did that. I can't yeah. believe I repeated that section again later on in the chapter. And, um, or, or this sounded really jumbled because sometimes it sounds okay inside your head. But when you try and convey it, it can come out like a lot of waffle, you know, and things like that. Yeah. So do you have that? I know, you like, I know you have waffles in America, but do you use the word <laughs> waffle? <laughs> yeah, waffle, like back and forth and – yeah yeah exactly so um and we we all do that you know um I know with my publishers when they were going through the edits you know there's things that they brought up that I didn't even think about or they said this doesn't really make sense or this needs clarifying or who's speaking here you know sometimes when you're like publishing off four people and it's like it gets if you don't say who's speaking it, it can be very confusing to know who's yeah. talking in certain dialogue and they've really as a <clears throat> there's a reason why I think Stephen King says this that we say he said or she said as a dialogue tag rather than he grumbled or he's he snapped you know because the said is invisible a lot of the time to the reader they don't see that so if you start using too many unusual taglines um they become very visible and it becomes a bit Cluttery. convoluted yeah, it starts cluttering yeah, up. So you can use like like snapshot, but you have to use things like that very sparingly. Right. Um, you know, because it's a lot of things to consider, but it, it's it's an interesting. You know, writing is a great thing. You never stop learning. You know, you never stop learning about the language and how you can use it. And absolutely I was not simple. Write simply and descriptively. The best books, the best sellers. You know, when you read them, they're not using convoluted language. They're not trying to be clever. It's actually very simple language, but it's very descriptive and emotive. And it's, I'm sure with your book on addiction, you know, or whatever you wrote, you were saying you wrote about addiction, you know, I'm sure it's very emotional. It's an emotional journey for you and you were feeling it. You know, then you want to make, um, it's like any storytelling, you want to make that person feel how you felt, you know, and connect with that. I like to believe that I'm simple enough to not write something too convoluted. <laughs> like my my vocabulary and all that kind of stuff is not the best. And I also, I mean, there, there's a lot to be said too for um, doing the thing, right? Because like we were talking about the law of attraction. Like for the longest time I thought, I want to write a book. I want to write a book. Like why haven't I written a book? Why is there no book yet? And it's like, well, because you didn't sit down and write a freaking book. <laughs> that's why there's not a book right so the, the the actually taking the action of doing it is a great step and i've realized after writing the first two things I, the first two books i wrote that with my third one that i i can allow it to be a process i've got i got sixty one thousand words into my third book in right. two, and a, two and a half weeks and i got to a point where i was like okay i need to take a step back and 
give it some time to breathe because it came to a crux and I needed to get, and I was like, why am I rushing through this process? I need to let it, you know, take the time it needs to take. And like you said, like I'm going to find an editor and I'll do the beta readers and there's no point in rushing something if I want to want it to be successful. Like I realized that doing the mm-hmm. first two books, it's like if I, if I want other people to love it as much as I love it, then I need to give it the, the, the love and care it deserves. Yeah, it's like cooking a beautiful meal, you know, getting the right ingredients in and the right spices and, yeah. you know, um, yeah, if it's, if it's rushed, it will read like it's rushed. And yeah. what, what's rushed? What are you rushing for anyway? Right. You know what I mean? It's like, why, why, why would you rush it? I know why I was rushing, but it, I think it's different for everybody. I was rushing because I had this like immense pressure in my, in my own mind to get this story out that I felt like was, had been holding me back for so many years and, I think I had to break this that I couldn't do it mentality because mm-hmm. I was like, I, there was this whole idea that I would never be able to, to write this book because I wasn't smart enough. Like when I was, I was laughed out of the writing center in college by the people who were like supposed to be reading, helping me edit my papers. They like laughed me out of the writing center and like people who I've been called stupid my whole life. And so this was a process for me of like overcoming this. I don't give a crap what anybody thinks yeah. about it. I'm just going to do it for myself. And once I got over it, once I got that out of the way, it was like, okay, now I can just, I can do something better. But I had had to get over, I had to get past that demon that was, you know. Yeah. And nobody has a right to say to somebody, you know, you're no good, you know, and at the end of the day, even if your manuscript and every manuscript, everybody's manuscript does need work. It does need other sets of eyes. That is a fact. You will not find um, you know, a published book from a traditional publish, publisher that hasn't had a lot of editing and a lot of work done on it. Um, and the thing is that I say hats off to anybody who sat down and written a book, even if you don't believe in it or you feel like it needs a lot of work. Because let's face it, sitting down and being creative is far better than just sitting there watching telly or sitting right. there just playing games on the computer. You know, that's that's a beautiful thing. You've decided to be creative. You decided to tell a story, yeah. and that story can be honed and polished and made to really shine. You yeah. know, um, but yeah, you know, to anybody who attempts to write, I think is a wonderful thing to try and be creative and create something. You know, there's nothing better in our lives. You know, to me, that's the your higher self shining through. You want to tell your story. You want to put even when you tell a fictional story, you're putting elements of what you know into that story. And, um, you know, I I certainly tried to rush when I was doing letters and it got me nowhere, you know, because what happened was I I was trying to rush and put myself under pressure. And um, and when I, having been a journalist, I was thinking, well, I do two and a half thousand words per per article and I can get that done in a week. So that's about the equivalent of a chapter. And I was seeing it that but you don't realize when you write fiction how difficult it is you've got to put dialogue you've got to describe characters you've got to get under their skin you have to have reflection of the character the character has to be reflecting on how they behave because the inner world of your protagonist is the plot that's what drives the plot forward that inner that inner world you know all the reflection when you think about and you read a story of the inner workings of that character's minds and why they're doing what they're doing that's your plot yeah so that's really important that you get the inner world of that character. You have to get to know your characters. Yeah, it's what makes it human for us. It's like we we have to ground our story to something realistic, even if it's the most fantastical story. It's got to be grounded in something that we can connect with as human beings. Because if it's not, then you know. And that's what, what I-, I would say as well. You know, get to know your characters. You know, write down. You know, what little quirks they have. Do they walk with a link? limp do they do they flick the froth around their cappuccino do they yeah. put their hair behind their ear a lot you know or um you know think of the kind of what makes up you know think of your friends and family and think about what makes up your characters what makes them tick what makes them what would make them come alive on the page because it's those little quirks and little characteristics that bring them alive those little subtle things that they do you know yeah and yeah. it tells you a lot about their character you know if somebody's walking really fast you know tells you a lot about them as a person just little bits of body language like that without actually saying it right you know what i mean absolutely 
Yeah, we're yeah we paint the picture that says a thousand words as opposed to saying that as opposed to just writing a thousand words where we paint exactly. a picture. Yeah. yeah, and that's showing. Our... That's, a, that's a great writing exercise too. I've done this um, when I was, I mean, a few months ago. I was like trying to do different creative writing exercises. Was literally just looking at a, like I, I painted a bowl of fruit with words, and yeah. and doing that with like still art. You know, when we we talk about doing still art and all this kind of stuff for creativity, like actually painting pictures, like even in your house, like visualizing it and painting it with your words as opposed to like actually painting it or whatever, and seeing how you can make these these things that are just objects come to life. Yeah, you know. Because yeah, that's, that's what it is. Great. It's like how, how can I give how can I give a banana personality? Yeah, exactly. You know. Yeah. No, that's a brilliant. It's a brilliant. Um, a brilliant technique to do that. It helps you learn how to show and not tell as well. Yeah, I came up with that on my own, so nobody told me how to do that. That's a great idea. I, that's brilliant. I don't know. I honestly, I don't know where it came from. I was just thinking about like how different ways I could learn how to write better because. I have no training whatsoever, and I thought, well, painters paint objects. Why don't I try to write an object and make it come alive? And it's just, I guess, it's you know, artistic ways of doing it. I also, I also have conversations with myself in writing, like different versions of myself, and I talk, I have them talk to each other, and that's a really cool. Um, yeah, that's great. Right as well different facets of you of yourself and, and when we write characters we're looking at different facets in a way bringing it i mean we're not all going to be murderers killers and do you know what i mean psychopaths but <laughs> looking at different facets of your personality that you can put into that character yeah and it's a lot of fun too it can be very therapeutic definitely yeah, yeah. well, well as the great. no this yeah it has been fantastic so much amazing information um, you're a wealth of knowledge. You really are. I, I truly appreciate. Well, I'm a learner. I'm still learning, so I'm no expert. But whatever. Well, that's you know, the best. Things that yeah, I've learned. That's the best way to be. Yeah. Always a Being student. A, we're a channel for it, right? We just have to be a channel for whatever whatever is coming out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Never, never being an expert. I'll put links to your uh, your uh, website and all your works in the description of the video um, and you know, your, your Facebook and Twitter pages as well uh, so that everybody can check out your work and follow you. Is there anything you want to tell the writing community or, or anybody else who sees this video before we go? I would just say keep creating. Creation is the most beautiful thing in the world. You know, we give so much joy to other people when we tell stories, you know, stories that go back to the Bible, you know, and we understand truth and we understand how to be, see the world through another person's perspective through movies and writing, you know, through storytelling. So it's a really um, incredible craft to learn, you know, so don't be scared to show your work to someone else and, and just make it better. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much, Esti. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Matt. My pleasure. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you would, subscribe to the channel and hit that notification for the bell. You know what? We love you. Love you. Love you. You know what?